All right, John's Gospel, chapter 18. We are now getting into what is going to be, uh, it's many, believe, many call this the, the, this is the judgment of Christ, but in reality, this is really Christ's judgment on us. This is really God's judgment that is laid on Christ, the judgment that was meant for all of us. And what we're going to see here as we go through this is we're going to see some... John moves through this, this time a little bit quicker than some of the other gospel writers here. He doesn't give us as much detail regarding the trial of Christ as uh, Luke's gospel, as Matthew's gospel, or even so much as Mark's gospel. But he does go through here and he, gives, he lays before us Pontius Pilate and then certainly the... Uh, the calling out of the Jews and all of those Jews and, and you guys know that as we entered into Passion Week as the Lord came in to Jerusalem on in the beginning of Passion Week now r mind you we spent a lot of days a lot of weeks covering the, what is the Lord's Prayer in John 17 we spent a couple of weeks just kind of going through that now mind you it's only been a couple of days so the Lord rides into Jerusalem on a colt and he rides into Jerusalem in what is considered to be the triumphal entry of Christ. And on that day, you guys know the story, on that day, many, many are crying out, Hosanna. They're laying down palm branches. They're laying down their own coats and blankets on the ground. They're hailing Christ as he comes in. And they're really looking for the Lord to set up his kingdom. And they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. And they love him because they think that now is going to be the time where the Lord is going to overthrow Rome and he's going to set up the kingdom and he's going to give everybody their own vine and their own fig tree to settle under all the Jews that are there and they're really excited about this time everybody's excited about it except for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the members of the Sanhedrin so as he comes riding in they're all crying out all the people all the Jews are crying out Hosanna Hosanna and they love him they love to see this now in only a couple of days time that very same crowd that is crying out Hosanna save now that very same crowd those very same people are going to be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Those very same people are going to really, there's going to be a, a, a bloodlust in the Jews and in their society and in their culture. They're going to be looking for the Lord to be crucified. They're going to be looking for the Lord to be embarrassed. They're going to be looking for the Lord to be completely humiliated. And we read last week that they start that by these unjust trials, these trials by night. And we know that the first hand to strike Jesus, the first drop of blood that's shed, is the hand of one of the temple soldiers as they strike Christ across the face. And the Lord would ask him, you know, why do you strike me? What is it? Why, why are you doing this? His response is not the response that we would have. His, re his response was very much unlike any of our responses that would be. And, and certainly Paul, we talked about Paul. When Paul gets struck in the face, his response is a little bit more human. In the book of Acts, when Paul gets struck across the mouth for the things that he's saying, <laughs> Paul, the great apostle, the writer of three quarters of the New Testament, his response is, man, the Lord is going to get you, you whitewashed tombs. That's his response. That would probably be my response too. And it would be yours too. But that's what we see. We see the response of Christ and the desire of Christ still in this position to want to see everybody there get saved. We see the heart of God the Father in the person of Christ desiring that all would come to know him. Still ministering to the hearts of those Jews who would strike him still ministering to the heart of those Roman soldiers who are going to be spitting on him and ripping out his beard, still doing all of that, still humbling himself. But the time has come, and he says that in the beginning of his prayer in John 17. He says, Father, the time has come. The time has come for the body that has been prepared for him to be laid down. The time has come for the body that has been prepared for him to be placed into a tomb. For him to absorb the wrath of God. That time is now. And all through the gospel of John, he'd been putting this off. He'd been saying, the time is not yet. The time is not yet. It has not yet come. It is not yet my time. He would say this to his mother. 
in John chapter 2, and then he would continue to say this all through John's gospel. The Jews would want to stone Christ. They'd want to pick him up for the things that he said. They want to pick up stones, and they would want to stone Christ. But because it was not his hour, his hour had not yet come, he would, he would go out in between them. He would disappear, if, it, as you, if, if you would. He would just kind of, you know, just kind of go into the crowd, just kind of mingle in and disappear. Because his hour had not yet come, but now his hour had come. All of creation, everybody in creation, stopping for a moment to just take a look at what's going on to God. You know, the salvation that we have, you know, Peter would say in his first letter to the church, Peter would say that the salvation that we have, angels desire to look into. They can't believe it. Of this salvation, the angels look into. They look into our own, the, the salvation that we claim, that by the way, we take for granted sometimes. We really do. I mean, we call ourselves saved. We call ourselves born again. We call ourselves Christians and believers. But, and, and we all know, I mean, we've read the Bible. Most of you have probably even read this account. And many of you could probably even cite it to me. So we all know what the, what the Word says. But we really do sometimes forget the brevity of this. We really do. We start walking through this age. We start walking through this life. We start to really think of our own salvation as Americans rather than Christians. We think that we're owed this. We think that we're really entitled to this. We start to think that this, the salvation that we have is, is something that God owes us. And then not only that, but the blessings that we have. The blessings. We're owed these blessings. And we really forget. We, we pay very little attention to the price that was paid in remembering. And really, we, we don't really remember the weight of this. That God himself subjects himself to his own creation. Even now, still, the Word of God holding together the very hands that would smite him on the face. The Word of God still now holding together the very nails that are going to be placed into his hands and into his feet. He himself subjecting himself to his creation. And not only that, he's going to get into this, we're going to get into the conversation that he has with Pontius Pilate. This conversation is deep. It's really deep. He stands before the governor. And this guy thinks he's something. He thinks that Rome is something. He thinks that his position means something. He thinks that his leadership actually means something. But it doesn't. Because the Lord answers him and says, listen, you would have no position, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you by my Father. You would have no position. So he, he levels the playing field. And he makes sure that every one of us remembers exactly who we are in Christ and who we are outside of Christ. Now after Peter denies, in verse 27, Peter then denied him again and immediately the rooster crowed. And in verse 28 it says, Then they, lay, they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning, it was about dawn. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Listen. This is the, the, the blatant hypocrisy just in this first verse should just jump right out at you. They didn't want to go into the praetorium because they didn't want to be defiled by entering into the presence of a Gentile, that they may, may touch a Gentile. They, they, they were all worried about that because they really wanted to eat the Passover. They wanted to get into the celebration. They wanted to make sure that they were adhering to the law and doing what the law had called them to do by, you know, really... You know, still kind of engaging in the Passover and, and taking part in the Passover. Meanwhile, they're calling for the blood of God. Do you see that? Meanwhile, what they're doing is they're trying to find a way to murder Christ. And they want to make sure they do it before the Passover starts, of course. Blatant hypocrisy. And this is what religion does. It focuses on the do's and don'ts and, does, and misses the heart of God. You realize that? This is why I'm so thankful that we, have a, we, that we have a belief. And even more than just a religion, you understand that? That we have a belief. That we believe in the truth. And that our salvation is not based on any religious activity. The religious activities come as a result of the truth. As a result 
of the belief. The do's and the don'ts come as a result of our salvation, not because of it and not for it. You understand? This is why religion is so dangerous. This is why any works-based religion is so dangerous. And this is why salvation is so glorious. That true salvation is so glorious. This is why the truth that, that we can actually engage in worshiping the Most High God, the true and the living God, we can do this from wherever we are without the expectation and without the reality and without thinking and knowing that, that our, you know, without even possibly believing a lie that our actions are what save us. And I want to say this to you. Your actions don't save you. And your actions don't condemn you. It's what you believe. But your actions will always be what's in your heart. Your words will always be what's in your heart. And even in your sin, even in the midst of Peter's sin, even when he would deny Christ, God always knew his heart. He always knew that he was never leaving him in his heart. He was, affa he was afraid. He was fearful. He responded to the pressure. But he never left Christ in his heart. David sinned, murdered, lied, cheated. But he never left God's heart. Ever. In fact, the Lord would say that he is a man after my own heart. Interesting. But we see the heart of these Pharisees, that they're just wanting to keep their religion and wanting to keep their position. They were more concerned about defiling themselves for the Passover than they were about taking to court and killing an innocent man. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? It's a valid question. Now remember, Pontius Pilate is the judge. So listen, anytime you bring somebody to court, what's for, the first thing that's read is what? The charge, man. What's the charge? What's he here for? I don't know about you. I've been to court plenty of times. I've been the defendant. I have. And the first thing that's read off is the charge. So what's the charge? Now it's interesting. John doesn't give us all the charges that they list out. But you know, in some of the other Gospels, it tells us. The first charge was that he was leading the people astray. The second charge was that he didn't pay taxes. And the third charge was that he claimed that he was king or messiah. Those are the three charges that they rattle off. And all of those charges were designed to get him to uh, be at fault to the Roman law. All of those charges were, were designed to get Rome to condemn him to death. So they lied. Now, the only charge they didn't necessarily lie about was the third one, which he claimed that he was a king in the Messiah. He said that straight, and he was. That was no lie. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to cause some sort of fear in Pontius Pilate. They're trying to get him to become afraid that this man was causing some sort of uh, insurrection or uprising. And so if the, if, if the Lord was doing that, then right away, the re immediate response, the immediate Roman response would be instantaneous death. And so that's what they're bringing up. So Pontius Pilate says, what's the charge? Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, <laughs> we would not have delivered him to you. It's obvious, don't you see? Clearly he's committed a crime because we brought him to you. Obviously. Now remember, the relationship between Pontius Pilate and these Jews is not good. They actually hate each other. But you guys know the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my what? My friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. There was all sorts of alliances being made during this time. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other. They hated each other. They couldn't stand each other. But yet, when it came to their hatred of Christ, they joined arms. They came together. 
And they answered and said to him, If you were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And that's the truth. Rome had taken away their right to capital punishment. Now every once in a while, Rome would turn a blind eye to that. We see that in Acts in the stoning of Stephen. Every so often, Rome would turn a blind eye to them just completely rising up and stoning someone to death. And you guys know what stoning was. Stoning was not just picking up little tiny pebbles and throwing them at somebody. Stoning was literally heaving rocks, probably the size of footballs or bigger, on top of somebody, crushing the skull under it until they died. That's what stoning was. It was brutal, a brutal death. But that right had been taken away. Rome had stripped all of the Jews and all of Israel for, from enacting any type of capital punishment on anyone. That right was strictly Roman. And then they say this, verse 31, Then Pilate said to them, You take him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. What death did he say he would die by? If I am lifted up, Yes, even I, if I am lifted up from the earth, then I will draw all men unto myself. He told everybody how he was going to die. Because every word must be fulfilled. Every word. In Deuteronomy it says, Cursed is he who, who hangs from a tree. Every word must be fulfilled. He who knew no sin became sin. He became the curse for us. He wasn't going to be stoned. He was going to be hung on a tree. And then Pilate entered into the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Now listen, are you the king of the Jews? Now, the Lord's answer here, we could probably skim over it really quick. But I don't want to. I want to take a look at this. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Do you know what he says? Who are you asking for? Are you speaking? Are you asking on your own account? Is this why you're asking me? Because listen, I really believe this with all of my heart. I believe that in that moment, the Lord was having a special moment with Pontius Pilate. And he wanted him to be saved. I think in that moment, he was really having a special moment with Pontius Pilate. This is before the scourging. This is before the Lord is led away and beat within an inch of his life. It's before all of that. I believe that he was having a special moment with Pontius Pilate. And he says, who are you asking for? Are you asking as a politician? Or are you asking as an individual? This is why we should be praying for our leaders. You get that. You understand that? Listen, we can get mad. I do. We can get mad at our government. We can get mad at everybody who's in power, in positions of power. We can get upset at the incredible injustice that we see happening in our nation. We can get upset with all the madness and the craziness. We can, we can get upset at the weakness of our politicians. The complete inaction, lack of action. We can get upset at all of that. We can get upset with the Republican Party. We can get upset with the Democrat Party. We can get upset with whatever other party seems to be in between. But you realize that what the Bible says is that we need to be praying for our leaders. Look at recently. Recently there was a letter that was put out. And there have been other Calvary chapels that have kind of fallen into suit with regard to um, engaging into, into civil disobedience and, you know, when it comes to um, not listening to our governing authorities when they tell us how to worship and when we can gather and when we can't gather, okay? And I've stated here in more than one occasion that when it comes down to we're going to be as safe as we possibly can be, okay? We're going to go, we're going to move forward in faith. We're going to be as safe as we can be. And I encourage people all the time that if you feel it at any point in time you feel unsafe, or you feel as if, you know, right now gathering inside a building is just not where you want to be. That's totally cool. 
If you want to come and gather, we offer face masks for free. We offer hand sanitizer all over the place. We're asking people to sanitize in and out of the bathrooms. We're cleaning up after everybody leaves. All that stuff. We're trying to make it as safe as possible for people to come together in fellowship. And if that's not your gig and you feel better or more at ease fellowshipping from home, that's cool. We broadcast live. You can do that. You can be a part of this from home. That's absolutely cool with us. However, we're not going to close again. The church will never go. If they impose a statewide lockdown again, the church is not going to be closed. The church is never closed. We're not going to close. We're going to stay open. We're going to do the best we can to minister to the flock of God the best that we can. We're going to stay open. However, let me say this. There are some pastors and some leaders that don't want to do that. And that is okay. Do you understand that? We cannot call these pastors and we cannot call some of these other leaders and other leaders in the church cowards for not doing that. They're trying to adhere and do the best that they can with what, with, with, with the, in the direction that God has given them, with the discipline that God has given them in order to lead the body of Christ. We should not be calling them out and calling them cowards and calling them weak. All you need to do is to take a look at the life of Christ to understand that. Listen to me. All you need to do is to read the Bible and take a look at the life of Christ to understand that. You just got to read it. The King of Kings, the Lord of Glory, the one who created the heavens and the earth is standing before a unrighteous, Gentile, human governor. And what's he saying? He's completely submitting himself to the will of his Father in this very moment. And his answer, his response to everything that Pontius Pilate is saying is gentle and loving, wanting him to come to know the truth. And reminding him that, by the way, he would have no position and no power unless it had been given to him by God the Father. He's going to get into that in a second. But you need to understand, and I need to understand, that this is why it's so important for us to pray for our leaders. We have to pray for the hearts of our leaders. We should be praying for the salvation of our leaders. Do you know how many times that the church over the years, many of you know this, how many times the church prayed for Bill Clinton? Many times. How many times did the church pray for George Bush? Many times. How many times did the church pray for Barack Obama to be saved? Many times. Many times. Even now, we should be praying for President Trump and, and his whole entire team. Why? Because he's like the greatest Christian president to ever be? No, because he's the president, and that's the position that he has. And we need to be praying for everybody that are, that are in positions of authority. That's why. Because we're held to a higher standard. We're held to a much higher standard. Listen, I'm going to show you this. Watch. Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered and said, My kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. He said, yep, I am a king. You say rightly that I'm a king. And for this cause, what cause? To cause some sort of anti-governmental insurrection? To rise up against everything that Rome was doing wrong? To rise up against some sort of like, you know, crazy injustice that Rome was imposing on the Jews? No. Listen to me. I know the plane's going by, but you need to hear me on this. Listen to me. Every believer, listen. Listen. Did he answer and say, we need to rise up against the Roman government because we're being unjustly treated? Is that what he said? No, that's not what he said. Do you say that we need to impose our rights given to us by God the Creator and that we need to gather together as much as we, as much as we can? No. He said, you say rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That is why he came. Listen to me. I know, 
I'm a patriot. I'm a veteran. I get irritated when I see happening in the government. I really do. Make no mistake about it. It's difficult for me to not stand in this pulpit and tell everybody in government to go fly a kite. You have no idea. It's incredibly difficult. But the reason Jesus came, the reason he came was to save the lives of whoever, whosoever would believe. That's the truth. And I understand that there are some, listen, John MacArthur from the West Coast put out this wonderful letter explaining to all the members of his church and the government out in California, the governors and everybody else that's in positions of power. He came out with a letter explaining why he would no longer engage in, well, what he was going to do was he was going to be engaging in civil disobedience. He was no longer going to adhere to the restrictions that the government was putting on the church. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Caesar is not the head of the church, and he's right. He said, well, Caesar's not the head of the church. We're going to come together as the body of Christ, and we're going to worship the way that God wants us to come together and worship. And by the way, he has some very good biblical stands on this, and he's absolutely right when it comes to some of this stuff. He's absolutely right. And there are other pastors and other preachers around the country that are kind of engaging in the same thing. And why? Because they see the blatant hypocrisy. Okay, so it's okay for people to come together in groups of thousands and destroy our nation and tear it apart and spray paint and go and light fires and engage in all sorts of other civil disobedience. It's cool for them to come together and they can do it in the name of peaceful protest. Meanwhile, there's nothing peaceful about it. And we're starting to see the blatant hypocrisy of what we see happening with the coronavirus and everything else. It's cool for them to do it, but the church can't come together. And listen, he's 100% right. I agree with him. There is nothing but blatant hypocrisy, and he's 100% right, and he's standing on the Word of God. And listen, in part, I agree with him. However, however, you don't have to take my word for it. Nowhere in Scripture, and and I just want to say this to you, nowhere in Scripture, ever, does the Lord tell anybody. Do you realize, I want to say this to you, do you realize that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the New Testament, does the Lord say anything against the Roman government? Who does he say, all of his charges are brought up against who? His own people. Anything negative or anything in judgment that he had to say was in regard to the Jews and his own people. Why? Why? Because they were the ones who had the truth. The Roman government was doing what the Roman government was supposed to do. Gentiles were doing what they were supposed to do. The unsaved were doing what unsaved people do. Which is persecute, crush, destroy, lie, cheat, steal. This is what unbelievers do. This is what the world is going to do. This is what the world is going to do to the church. This is what the Antichrist is going to do to the church. It's going to happen. But judgment starts first where? In the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. I want to read this to you. Peter would say this in 1 Peter 2. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only the good and the gentle, but also the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults if you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who, he who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Listen to me. I don't, I don't know where your, where your stand is on this. And, I, and to be honest with you, I only care about what the Bible says. Your opinion is your opinion, and that's great. Good for you. But I only care about what the Word of God says with regard to the body of Christ and how we are to contend for the faith. 
That's it. What the Bible says. Subject yourselves to your masters. Subject yourselves to the governing authorities. Paul would say it over and over and over again. Jesus said, if they compel you to go one mile, then go with them how many? Two. As long as what it's doing is not interfering with your walk. Now listen, the argument can be made. The argument can be made that interfering with the church and interfering with how often we're able to get together is interfering with the ordinance of God and what we're called to do as believers. It absolutely can be made. And listen, by the way, I see that argument, which is why we're going to remain open. However, if the government comes in and tells us we need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, that's a different story. That's a different story. If they tell us that we can't do baptism, that's a different story. If they tell us that we can't come, come and worship and sing songs in church like they're doing out in California and like they're doing right now in Nevada, if they tell us that we can't do that, now that's a whole different story. That's a different story. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> you cannot tell us how we're going to worship God. You can't. However, if they come and say, we're asking for all of these gatherings to social distance if possible and to wear masks if possible and to try to prevent the spread of a disease that has killed some people. I don't see any problem with that. That's cool. In fact, that's probably what should have happened from the beginning rather than completely shutting down an entire nation and destroying our economy. That's probably what we could have done in the beginning. But according to the word of God and what we see as an example, even here, the ministry of Christ was not to rise up against Rome. The ministry of Christ was to come and to preach the truth. And you remember, Paul, when he was arrested, what did he do <laughs> in his chains? What did he do? He was preaching to every Praetorian guard that he was chained to, giving them the gospel. And you know what happened? Caesar's household was getting saved. Caesar's household was getting saved. He was put in chains. He was arrested and put away unjustly for preaching the word of God. And you know what he did? In the chains, he preached the word of God. Because that's our job. Yes, we can protest. Yes, we can stand up. Yes, we can stand up for things that we don't see as right. Absolutely as Americans. And you should, and we should. But the primary focus of the church and the body of Christ is preaching the truth. I don't care if we have to do it in this field in December. If that's what it takes, and that's what I'll do. I'll stand out here. I get a whole snowsuit. The guys will serve. We'll set this whole thing up. I don't care. You guys can stay in your nice warm cars, and we'll stand out here, and I'll preach the gospel in a snowsuit if that's what it takes. Because that's what it takes sometimes. Please don't tell me. Please don't tell me that you can't think like an American when it comes to this stuff. Because you know what? They do that. They do that on an everyday, every week basis in other countries and other parts of the world. You realize that. In other parts of the world, to preach the gospel is a death sentence. And they're meeting up in basements. They're not, you don't see them protesting. You see them getting arrested in China. <laughs> They're doing it. They're getting arrested in China. They're preaching the truth. Why? Because they won't just sit there and bow the knee to Caesar. They won't do it. But they're preaching the truth. They're getting persecuted for righteousness' sake. They can barely come together without getting arrested and thrown into a labor camp. We need to remember that. Stay focused on what's important. Stay focused on the truth. For this reason he came. That's what he says. For this reason I came. To preach the truth. Not to make Americans. You, can, you guys can tire and feather me and carry me off if you want to. I don't care. He did not come into the world to make Americans. He came into the world to preach the truth and to make dead people alive. And Pilate said to him, 
what is truth? What is truth? It's an old philosophical question. Because even back then, they still, ta they still taught and thought that truth was subjective. That your truth is different from my truth, and we just need to all come together and kind of figure it out. We can come together with different philosophies and different ways of thinking, and maybe we can come together to the truth. And you can have your truth, and I can have my truth, but Christ came to establish the truth. There is no other truth. There is nothing else to know. Nothing else to know about sin, about righteousness, and about eternity and judgment. There is nothing else to know. Jesus came and gave it all to us. The Logos, the Word, became flesh. And we see the price for our sin put on Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is what is truth. And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Now listen, it's worth noting that four times throughout this trial, four times he verbally calls Christ a king. And then the fifth time, he nails it above his head on the cross. Four times he calls him a king with his, with his own mouth. And then the fifth time, he claims it and nails it to a sign put above the head of Christ. And then they all cried out again saying, not this man but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. He was a thief. He was put in jail because he was a robber. He was a thief. He was a zealot. He was leading insurrections. Now again, we kind of have that... Um, Anybody, you guys have probably seen The Passion of the Christ. We probably all have seen it. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. It's a really great movie. But we all kind of have in our minds, we have that vision of that character of Barabbas where he's this kind of like heavyset guy with like one eye, a couple missing teeth, big burly beard, right? This kind of like caveman looking dude. I, it's important for us to know that that probably wasn't this guy. This guy Barabbas was a man who was absolutely able and, and willing to lead an insurrection, to lead men, he was a zealot. He was somebody who was very capable of causing an uprising. And that is why he was in prison. But put yourself in the position of this man. Do you know what his name means? Bar is son of. Abba means the father. Baraba. Do you know the, the, in the Talmud? Joshua. Joshua was his name. Joshua, the son of the father. Barabbas. In jail. For crimes that he did commit. There was no question of his guilt. He was guilty of crimes and he was in jail for those crimes. And he's waiting his trial and he's waiting his execution. That day, on the docket, on the schedule, there were three crucifixions on the schedule for that day. Put yourself in the story. You're Barabbas, you're guilty. Every one of us has been. You're sitting in your jail cell, guilty as charged. And all of a sudden, down a long dungeon of a hallway, you hear the footsteps of a gatekeeper or a guard. And all you can think to yourself is this is it. Maybe there was a point in, the, in, that, in that moment that he's in. We don't know. Maybe there's a point in that. In there's a, maybe there's a moment while he's, while he's in prison. Maybe he's just wondering how he got here. How the circumstances of his life led him to prison. Maybe one bad decision turned into another bad decision, turned into another bad decision, and all of those bad decisions kind of culminate, and now here he is. He's in jail. He's in jail for crimes that he committed. And he's awaiting crucifixion, which, by the way, crucifixion is literally...
literally the worst way to die. Romans had mastered torture. They had mastered torture and killing somebody. Mastered it. And by the way, it's also worth noting that everybody we think the crucifixion looked like the crucifix that we see, most crucifixions, most of them, was not how Christ was crucified. Most crucifixions were probably about two feet off the ground, maybe a little bit less than that. And what they would do, instead of putting your, your feet together one on top of the other, what they would do is they would turn you to your side and they'd put a spike right through your heels like an ear piercing. Right through your heels. And so it would be confirmed that you would bruise his heel. The enemy would bruise the heel of the coming Messiah. Now, what they would do is they'd put a couple spikes in your wrist, probably wouldn't go straight through your hand. It would have to go through your wrist so that you wouldn't fall off. Because if they put a spike through your hand, it would just come out between your fingers because the weight of the body hanging on the cross would just go and just split right through the fingers. So what they would do is they would go through your wrist right between the radius and the ulna, so you could hang there painfully. They mastered it. It was great. And your Barabbas, awaiting the execution of your crime. And here it comes. Here comes the soldier. Here comes the footsteps. Here comes the key in the door. And the door opens. And you stand up and you're ready to go. You're ready to receive the execution. The order is being carried out. You're guilty and you are going to stand before everybody guilty. You're going to be crucified and you're going to be crucified about two feet off the ground so that when the jackals come by, they can eat your feet to add to the torture. And the guard opens the door. And he says, you've been set free. Because another Jesus is in your place. You've been set free. And there's another man who's innocent. And he's about to take your place. Every one of us is a Barabbas. Every one of us is guilty. Every one of us deserves to be in the place where Barabbas was. Every one of us. But because an innocent Christ stood in our place, we hear the gatekeeper say, you've been set free. You've been set free. And not only that, in that freedom, there's no record of your charge. You realize that that's what justification means? That not only are you set free, but there is no record of your charge. There's no record of your sin. God chooses not to remember. And that day, a guilty Barabbas is set free by an innocent Christ. It's important for us to get that. Because after that, in verse 1, it says that they scourged him. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Everything that was meant for Barabbas that day fell on Christ. The scourging was brutal. We'll get into it a little bit more next week. The scourging was brutal. It was horrendous. The scourging, the movie can't even do justice. I want you to know that. The movie can't even do the scourging justice. If you saw it and you cringed a little bit when you saw it, 
every one of us has, we've all seen it, and it's, it's really probably the most accurate depiction that we've ever seen put into theater, but the truth is, is that it really doesn't do it any justice. The scourging was brutal. The scourging was something otherworldly. The Bible actually says in Isaiah 53 that his visage, his visage was marred more than any man. And I said this before and I'll say it again. If there's one thing that I love about the Word of God, if there's one thing that I love about the Bible is that it doesn't ever exaggerate. The Word of God never exaggerates. It just tells you what happened. And when the Lord says, when God says, and when Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 53 that he was marred, his visage was so marred more than any man, I believe that. And you know what the Bible says? Pilate took him and scourged him. That's all it says. We have to fill in the blanks. But that's what the Bible says. It says Pilate took him and scourged him. In the hopes that that would satiate a bloodlust in the Jews. In the hopes that that would somehow calm down a mob mentality in the hopes that maybe taking a weaker move, making a weaker move, would somehow quench the desire for the Jews to see this innocent man because he already said, I find no fault in him. There's nothing wrong. He hasn't done anything wrong. And he scourged them anyway. And in this particular instance, every single one of us take our place in what happened because in adam all sin right that's a heaping amen right in adam all sin in this instance everybody sins every jew every gentile every member of humanity that is represented here all of us sin we sin And all it says is Pilate scourged him. All it says, really simple. The scourging was brutal. And that came after the freeing of a guilty man. Barabbas was guilty, and so was I, and so were you, and so were you. And you realize that this is the truth? This is what we should be proclaiming. Whenever we want to sit there and throw our arms up in the air in the credible injustice that we see happening all over our country, when we start to see a little bit more of our rights taken away, and they are. And by the way, it's worth noting that as believers, listen, you need to get this, you need to understand this, that as believers, know this. More of your rights will be taken away as a believer. All you need to do is read the scriptures. More of our rights, what we think are rights, will be squeezed as believers. For if they persecuted me, Christ would say, then they will also persecute you. And the enemy doesn't care about the Bill of Rights that we have. You understand that there's no spiritual Geneva Convention. Okay? There's no spiritual Supreme Court for us to appeal to. The only court that we can appeal to as believers is the highest court and the court of Christ. And we can appeal to him. And you know what he says? If they persecuted me, then they're going to persecute you. There's going to be, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. In this world, you will suffer. In this age, you will suffer. As Americans, you will suffer. You will suffer persecution. And we can battle as much as we want. But you know and I know that the prince and the power and the ruler of the air, the prince and the power and the ruler of this age has control over this world. Why? Because the Lord said right here in this scripture, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my servants would fight. If it were, they would fight like they do in Revelation chapter 12 when a great war breaks out in heaven. And Michael makes war. Michael and all the angels make war against the dragon and his angels. That is the kingdom of heaven. Totally different. You see that happen. We see that happen. 
But until then, we need to be proclaiming the truth. You need to be proclaiming the truth that is in you. You need to be proclaiming the truth to a lost and dying world of the freedom that you have in Christ because your name and my name is Barabbas. And we've been set free by an innocent Messiah. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful weather. I thank you for the breeze that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, that you've made this day tolerable and not oppressing. You've made your word alive. I thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy. We ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that for each one of us, Lord, that, we, that for everyone that's here today, Lord, that we would have heard from you today. That we would leave this fellowship this morning different, changed, challenged, Lord. That we would leave this fellowship knowing that we've heard from you and heard from heaven our home. I pray, Lord, that your word would continue to become more real and more alive to each one of us. Lord, as we leave here today, and even as we lift up our voices in this last song, I pray, Lord Father, that you would continue to work on our hearts, continue to soften us, Lord, that we wouldn't become distracted by the things that we see happening in the world around us. That we would stay focused. That we would stay focused on you, stay focused on the kingdom, stay focused on your words, stay focused in prayer. That we would walk in wisdom, Lord Jesus, our King, that we would walk in love. Lord, we do pray for our friends and for our family. Lord, if there's anyone here today that's just been distant, if there's anyone here today, this morning, Lord, that's just been distant, Maybe just kind of putting you on back burner. Maybe have lost sight of the truth and lost sight of the reality of Christ. Maybe been distracted by too many other things and too many other world situations and world problems, Lord Father. Maybe we've gotten ourselves kind of wrapped up in some things that we ought not to be wrapped up in. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that is feeling that tug, that is feeling the call to get back into fellowship, I pray, Lord, today would be the day they would do that. I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here today, this morning, that has never prayed to receive Christ and make you Lord of their life, I pray that today would be the day that they would do that, Lord. That they would realize, Lord, that they are a Barabbas, guilty of sin, but that they would claim the innocent blood of Christ. That they would receive you today as their Lord and as their Savior. They would leave here knowing that heaven is their home based on your work and not their own. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here that needs to be reminded of that, that they would leave here today filled, knowing the truth. I pray, Lord, and through these troublesome times ahead, through what we see happening in our world, I pray, Lord, that you would guide us and that you would keep us and that you would hold us. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us into all truth, Lord, that you would put a heavenly hedge of protection around the body of Christ and around the church, Lord, as we continue to gather by faith. I pray, Lord, Father, that we would continue to move and follow the good shepherd, Lord. That as we see the day approaching, Lord, as we see some very, very strange things on the horizon in our world, that we would stay focused on the truth and we would stay focused on your word. That we would be men and women devoted to prayer. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Forgive us for the times that we just fall so short, Lord. We know that you do. Forgive us for the times, Lord Jesus, that we just come so short of your perfection. It is in these times, Lord, that we claim your blood, your holiness, your perfection, your grace on us. Your grace. Jesus, our King. 
as we live in the light of these truths, these wonderful truths that you've given us in your word, that we wouldn't just be hearers today, that we would be doers, doers of your word. We lift our voices to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.